குட் ஈவினிங் ஃப்ரெண்ட்ஸ் ஐ வெல்கம் யூ ஆல் டு த ஹிந்து நியூஸ் பேப்பர் அனாலிசிஸ் பிராட் யூ பை த சங்கர் ஏஎஸ் அகாடமி டுடேஸ் டேட் இஸ் தேர்ட் ஜனவரி டுவெண்ட்டி டுவெண்ட்டி ஃபோர் ஹியர் ஆர் த லிஸ்ட் ஆஃப் நியூஸ் ஆர்டிகல்ஸ் விச் வி ஆர் கோயிங் டு டிஸ்கஸ் டுடே ஸோ லெட்ஸ் கெட் இன் டு டிஸ்கஷன் த ரூல்ஸ் ரிலேட்டட் டு சிட்டிசன்ஷிப் அமெண்ட்மெண்ட் ஆக்ட் சிஏஏ மை பி வெல் இன்ட்ரோடியூஸ்டு பிஃபோர் த அப்கமிங் லோக்சபா எலெக்ஷன்ஸ் சி த சிட்டிசன்ஷிப் ஆக்ட் வாஸ் அப்ரூவ்ட் இன் டுவெண்ட்டி நைன்டீன் அக்கார்டிங் டு அன் அஃபிஷியல் ஹிந்துஸ் ஃப்ரம் பாகிஸ்தான் ஹூ அரைவ் லீகல் இன் இந்தியா can now apply for citizenship in a online mode these individual will be considered eligible for applying despite their expired documents see this is the crux of the article in this context let us understand some important provisions of the citizenship amendment act see the citizenship amendment act was enacted to grant citizenship to certain migrants in india this act had made some amendments in the citizenship act 1955 to meet this purpose okay Now let us see the key provisions of the Citizenship Amendment Act 2019. Firstly, this act aims to grant citizenship to the people belonging to six religions who came from Afghanistan, Bangladesh and Pakistan. See, these six religions includes Hindu, Sikhs, Buddhist, Jainis, Parsis and Christians. Here note that the act does not apply to the Muslims who migrated to India from the Afghanistan, Bangladesh and Pakistan. The act says that people belonging to these six religions from three countries who entered India on or before December 31, 2014 will not be treated as illegal migrants and so they will be granted citizenship in a due course. So let us see the second proviso. Secondly, the Citizenship Act 2019 relaxed the requirement of naturalization criteria. Generally know that 11 years of staying in India is required to get Indian citizenship through the process of naturalization. But the CAA 2019 relaxed this 11 year requirement to just 5 years. So if the people belonging to the 6 religions and who stayed in India for 5 years, they can be granted citizenship through naturalization process. Thirdly, the act says that people belonging to the 6 religion shall deem to be the citizens of India from the date of their entry into India. This means this status or citizenship status this status can be granted once they accuse citizenship the act further means that all legal proceedings against such people with respect to the illegal migration will now be closed basically this act aims to grant citizenship to those who faced religious prosecution in Afghanistan Bangladesh and Pakistan moreover it also aims to protect such people from the legal proceedings of illegal migration And finally the act mentions that the provisions of CAA 2019 shall not be applied to illegal migrants who are living in the tribal areas of Assam, Meghalaya, Mizoram or Tripura. Moreover the act mentioned that it is not applicable to the areas which are being covered under inner line permit as notified under the Bengal Eastern Frontier Regulation Act 1873. See these are all some of the provisions of the act. Now Let us see the some of the concerns regarding the CAA. First concern is that it is said to be against the fundamental rights. Know that the critics argues that it is the violative of article 14 which guarantees right to equality to people. Moreover know that article 14 is applicable to both the citizens and foreigners. The act also contradicts the principles of secularism which is get enshrined in the preamble of the constitution. Secondly this act is discriminatory in nature. India has several other refugees that includes Tamil from Sri Lanka, Hindu Rohingyas from Myanmar. See, they are not covered under this act. Thirdly, the problem is with the difficulty in administration. See, it is very difficult for the government to differentiate between the illegal migrants and those who are actually persecuted. Lastly, it might hamper the bilateral ties between our neighboring countries. See, this act throws the light of the religious oppression that has happened and is happening in these countries. so it may worsen our bilateral ties with the neighboring countries see this is all the concerns regarding the caa so in our discussion we basically we in the first part we saw about the various provisions of the act and in the second part we saw some important concerns regarding the caa amendment act 2019 so with this learned points let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article for our analysis the editorial here is about the gst collection the article says that so the gst collection has increased our government needs to stay very cautious see this is about the article in this context in our discussion let us try and solve the mains related question related to gst look at the question 
the gst was promised to be the most significant indirect tax reforms since independence in india examine the performance of gst in india over the past 6 years see the directive word is examine when the question is a directive word examine you have to do a detailed and in depth analysis of the topic know that you have to discuss the various aspects of the subject matter in the case of this question you have to write about the various aspects of the performance of gst see this is how we have to approach this question now let us look at the syllabus this question can be asked in gs paper 3 under the topic of mobilization of resources okay now let us start answering the question in the introduction you can write about the basics of gst see gst is a indirect tax which has replaced many indirect taxes in india before the gst regime we have had different indirect tax structures in our country the introduction of gst was a very significant step in the field of indirect tax reforms in india guys know that gst has replaced 17 indirect taxes these indirect taxes were consolidated into one gst the amalgamation of a large number of central and state taxes into a single tax reduced the ill effects of cascading or double taxation in a major way moreover it also paved the way for a common national market guys know that the taxes subsumed under gst were central excise duty additional excise duty service tax additional customs duty special additional customs duty value added tax central sales tax entry tax luxury tax octroi and purchase tax the 101 constitutional amendment act of 2016 was introduced to implement the gst regime this amendment had also introduced article 246a 269a and 279a in our constitution see this is a very brief introduction about gst you can use some points mentioned here in your own introduction part now this is with the introduction now let us uh, delve into body part of the answer here we have to write about the performance of gst we can divide this body into two parts one is the positives of gst and second is the hurdles first let us look at the positives here you can mentioned about the revenue collection guys look at this graph as you can see that except during the pandemic years where the gst collection has plateaued the gst collection has consistently increased in the other years this shows two things one is that gst registration have had increased see it has increased from 1.03 crore in april 2018 to 1.36 crores in april 2023 this increase in registration has in turn increased the tax base and it amped up the formalization of indian industries the other thing is that due to the simplicity of the gst regime the tax complaints has also increased as per the recent report pre gst non compliances of more than 55% has been reduced to the meager number of less than 20% it is these two things that has resulted in the increase in gst collection see this is the may first major positive secondly due to the simplification of the tax structure under gst the ease of doing business in india has improved a lot this has spurred the economic activity which resulted in employment generation thirdly gst with its one nation one tax mantra has enhanced the interstate trade in our country lastly by incorporating the innovative ideas like input tax credit and other innovations like e way bill the gst regime has brought down the evasion of taxes here e way bill is nothing but an electronically generated permit which is very needed for an interstate or intra state transportation of goods worth more than 50000 rupees see these are all some of the positive aspects of the gst regime now coming to the hurdles though it is widely stated that gst is a one nation one taxation regime there exist a multiple tax rates under the gst know that gst rates in india for various goods and services are being divided into four slabs that is 5% 12% 18% and 28% see this has further complicated the procedures second hurdle is with respect to the structure of this gst see gst is a destination based taxation so the states like tamil nadu and gujarat with a lot of manufacturing capacity are losing their own revenues the third issue is with the compliance burden see many msmes are not able to cope up with the complicated compliance burden associated with the gst regime see the fourth hurdle is with respect to the technical issues associated with the gst and interface see this has also impacted the e way bill generation in india and fifthly while implementing the gst regime the union government claimed that as the gst addresses the issue of various cascadeation of taxes so 
the end consumer will experience a reduction in prices but this did not happen in reality so to address this union government even appointed national anti profiteering authority to ensure that the gst rate reductions were being passed on by the firm to the consumers but sadly this also did not result in the reduction of the prices for the end consumers lastly certain sections of the economists claim that the increase in gst collection is not due to the increase in tax base or compliances but mainly due to inflation for example year on year growth in the gst collections in march 22 was 14.7% in nominal terms but when it got adjusted to inflation it has drastically come down to 3.7% see these are all some of the hurdles that gst regime currently faces in india now having done the body part of the answer let us come to the conclusion part in the conclusion part you can mention some important points to improve the gst regime the points can be simplifying the gst filing mechanism second point is creating a unified tax lab under the gst regime third is to bring petroleum and electricity under the gst regime fourthly addressing the glitches in the gst in interface and finally ensuring that national anti profiteering authority achieves the mandate which is being given to it so you can write these points in your conclusion see in our discussion we have seen the performance of gsts and in the second part we saw about the various hurdles in the present gst regime so with this learned points we have come to the end of the discussion so let us finish this and take up the next news article for our analysis take a look at this news article the annual nesting season of the olive ridley turtles has started this month but sadly nearly 8 olive ridley turtles were found dead in chennai over the past 3 days it's widely believed that the oil spills which happened during the cyclone migjam is a cause of the death of this turtle but the wildlife warden ruled out the spillage as a reason for this deaths see this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us quickly go through some of the important facts about olive ridley turtles see olive ridley turtles are the smallest and most abundant of all sea turtles found in the world they inhabit the warm waters of pacific atlantic and indian oceans know that name for the sea turtle is because of the color of its shell they have an olive green colored shell which is heart shaped and rounded in appearances now let us see the physical features of this turtle see the turtle grew to a height of about 2 feet in length and 50 kg in weight know that males and female turtles grow at the same size however females have a slightly more rounded carapace when compared to male now let us see the consumption pattern of this turtle see the turtles are carnivorous it means they are meat eaters and they mainly feed on jellyfish shrimp snails crabs molluscs and a wide variety of fishes and their eggs remember these turtles spend their entire lives in ocean and migrate thousands of kilometer between feeding and mating grounds in the course of a year but one of the important features about this turtle is that the female turtle return to the very same beach from where they first hatched to lay their eggs during this phenomenal nesting up to 6 lakhs and more females emerge from the water over a period of 5 to 7 days to lay their eggs this unique kind of mass nesting is known as aribada in other words aribada is a phenomenon in which thousands of female come together on the same beach to lay eggs olive ridley along with their cousin kemps ridley are best known for this unique mass nesting pattern they usually dig a conical nest about 1 and 1/2 feet deep within their hind flippers and they lay their eggs in this conical nest see guys the coast of orissa in india is the largest mass nesting site for the olive ridley it is followed by the coast of mexico and costa rica after about 45 to 65 days the egg begins to hatch and these beaches will be swamped with crawling olive ridley turtle babies okay now with this basics now let us see the threats for the olive ridley know that the hatching survival rate of olive ridley is very low due to the risk of predation it is estimated that approximately one hatching surveys to reach adulthood for every 1000 hatchlings that enter the sea water maybe this might also be the reason why aribada happen in which a single female can lay 80 to 120 eggs and sometime even twice in a season so lastly let us see the protection status of the turtles the olive ridley turtle is listed as vulnerable under iucn status it's also under appendix 1 of sites and appendix 1 and 2 of the conservation of migratory species or cms treaty 
this is all about this discussion in this discussion in the first part we saw some basic facts about olive ridley and in the second part we saw about the threats and the conservation status of the turtles with this learned points let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article for our analysis look at this news article it talks about the government's decision to scrap the free movement regime fmr along the myanmar border so from now onwards if people living in border area wanted to cross over indian border they would require visas the border areas have been already surveyed with the help of drones so around 300 kilometers of the border will be fenced sooner see this is the crux of the news article in this context let us quickly go through free movement regime or fmr in a prelims perspective see fmr was implemented in 2018 as a part of act east policy as you all know the border between india and myanmar runs for 1643 kilometers in the four states of mizoram manipur nagaland and arunachal pradesh the fmr facilitates the migration across the indo myanmar borders it's actually a mutually agreed agreement between the india and myanmar so fmr allows the tribes living on the both the sides of the border to travel up to 16 km inside the other country without visa moreover know that they can even stay for up to 2 weeks per visit so we have to know why it was implemented see the border between india and myanmar was demarcated by the british in 1826 since independence this unfenced border is the official border line between the two countries but the problem is this border effectively divided people of same ethnicity and culture into two countries without their local assent for example know that in manipur's more region there are villages where some homes are in myanmar and some homes are in india in nagaland's mon district the border actually passes through the house of chief of the village splitting even his own home into two countries so since the people in the region have strong ethnic and familial ties across the border it was very essential to conceptualize the fmr to facilitate people to people contact know that apart from this fmr was conceived to provide impetus to the local trade and business see the region has a long history of trans border commerce through customs and border hards so it facilitates the sustenance of local livelihoods for border people in myanmar also indian towns are very closer for business education and health care than even the towns in their own country see this is all about the fmr currently government is in the plan to scrap the fmr due to various reasons like illegal immigration drug trafficking and insurgency moreover following the myanmar's military coup in 2021 over 40000 refugees have entered mizoram and around 4000 have entered manipur this increases the security concerns as well as for india know that already manipur has suspended fmr since 2020 due to covid pandemic so now the government is going to scrap the entire fmr regime across the northeastern states see this is all about the discussion in this discussion we saw some conceptualized points about the fmr and some prelims related facts about the free movement regime with this learned points let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article for our analysis this news article talks about the new changes brought to the appointment of chief election commissioner and the election commissioners see in our news article discussion first let us understand how both chief election commissioner and election commissioner are being appointed currently and then we shall see about the recent news article which is being given in the paper let us get into discussion see election commission is a constitutional body established directly by the indian constitution under article 324 as per the article the president has the sole right to fix the number of members in the election commission currently election commission functions as a multi member body consists of three election commissioners among them one member is appointed as the chief election commissioner the appointment of chief election commissioner and other commissioner is made by the president know that they hold office for a term of 6 years or until they attain the age of 65 years this is how both the cec and ec are being currently appointed see in march 2023 the supreme court using its power under article 142 laid down that the cec and ec shall be appointed by a committee consists of prime minister chief justice of india and the leader of opposition or the largest opposition party in lok sabha here note that article 142 gives the supreme court the power to issue any direction for doing complete justice in any matter so the, the supreme court issued the order based on the recommendations of two committees one is 
தினேஷ் கோஸ்வாமி கமிட்டி ஆன் எலக்ட்ரோரல் ரிஃபார்ம்ஸ் நைன்டீன் அண்ட் த செகண்ட் இஸ் லா கமிஷன்ஸ் டூ ஃபிஃப்டி ரிப்போர்ட் ஆன் எலக்ட்ரோரல் ரிஃபார்ம்ஸ் சி எஸ்சி செட் தட் திஸ் அப்பாயின்மெண்ட் மெக்கானிசம் சி சீஃப் எலெக்ஷன் கமிஷனர் அண்ட் எலெக்ஷன் கமிஷனர் வில் பி இன் பிளேஸ் அண்டில் பார்லிமெண்ட் எலக்ஸ் அ நியூ லா ஆன் திஸ் மேட்டர் கான்சிக்வென்ட்லி த சிஇசி அண்ட் அதர் இசிஸ் அப்பாயின்மெண்ட் கண்டிஷன்ஸ் ஆஃப் சர்வீஸ் அண்ட் டேர்ம்ஸ் ஆஃப் ஆஃபீஸ் ஆக்ட் டுவெண்ட்டி டுவெண்ட்டி த்ரீ வாஸ் எனக்டட் திஸ் ஆக்ட் செட் தட் போத் சீஃப் எலெக்ஷன் கமிஷனர் அண்ட் எலெக்ஷன் கமிஷனர் வில் பி அப்பாயிண்டட் வித் த ப்ரெசிடென்ட் அப்பான் த ரெக்கமெண்டேஷன் ஆஃப் அ செலெக்ஷன் கமிட்டி நோட் தட் திஸ் செலெக்ஷன் கமிட்டி வில் கன்சிஸ்ட் ஆஃப் பிரைம் மினிஸ்டர் யூனியன் கேபினட் மினிஸ்டர் அண்ட் த லீடர் ஆஃப் அப்போசிஷன் ஆர் த லீடர் ஆஃப் லார்ஜஸ்ட் அப்போசிஷன் பார்ட்டி இன் லோக்சபா மோர் ஓவர் திஸ் ஆக்ட் ஆல்சோ ப்ரொவைட்ஸ் ஃபார் அ சர்ச் கமிட்டி சி திஸ் கமிட்டி இஸ் ஹெடட் வித் த கேபினட் செக்ரட்டரி திஸ் சர்ச் கமிட்டி will propose a panel of names to the selection committee this is all about the recent act enacted by the union government now comes the point of contention see numerous petitions have been filed in the supreme court saying that the chief justice of india has been replaced by the unit cabinet minister in the selection committee see this change has overturned the previous judgment of the supreme court and the appointment procedure gives the government a more control over the process see this is what the hindu newspaper article is written about So we have to write for the Supreme Court decision in this matter. See this is all about the discussion. With this learned points, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article for our analysis. Look at this news article. This article highlights the evolution of perspectives on slums in India over a period of years. In our discussion, let us see the points mentioned in the article in a detailed manner. See, this is least important for prelims but paramount for your mains examination. Okay, let us see the points mentioned in the article. Firstly, let us take up the 1950s to 60s period. India, a newly independent nation, viewed slums as a consequence of partition and population influx. This is mainly due to partition where people migrated and settled near the major cities. The areas these people settled lacked basic amenities. So during this period, the government viewed slums as an epidemic. At that point in time, the government thought that the to address this issue, the only solution available to them is the eradication or destruction of slums altogether however government intervention was limited as most of the slums were located in the private land this changed after the slum area act 1956 know that this act facilitated the involvement of slum and this act provided for the after formal notification of a area as a slum see this is what happened in 50s and 60s now moving on to the next decade that is 70s to 80s In this period the government started viewing slum as a necessary evil so due to this change in the position the government focused on the development of slum rather than the demolition of the slum government started its focus on improving the basic communities in the slum during this era government also initiated town planning in this period through this the government pushed the slums to the periphery of the city now let us move on to 80s to 90s decade see During this period the government started to view cities including the slums as a economic asset rather than the liabilities this is because government came to a realization that it is the cities along with the slums acted as the engine of growth in india due to this economic reasoning overshadowed social perspectives government started to view the funding provided to the city as an asset rather than the liability the focus shifted from town planning to broader housing policies also in 1996 national slum development program was launched through this program the union government started providing funds directly for the redevelopment of slum okay now let us move on to 2000 to current period see the census data 2011 broadened the understanding of slum this understanding led to the targeted schemes also during this period based on the statistical information the government came to a realization that slums which is formed in the urban area is mainly due to urban housing defects and lack of proper planning so the government started focusing its policy to address this said issues government also focused on giving proper right slum dwellers for their upliftment see this is all regarding this discussion through this discussion we understand the progressive transformation of how slums are being perceived in india we also saw how the government solution towards addressing the various issues changed from the complete eradication to technically solve the urban issues this is all regarding this news discussion with this let us move on to the next part of our video that is to discuss the preliminary practice questions guys today i am having four questions 
I'll solve three of them and one will be a quiz question for you to solve. Okay, let us move on to the first question. Consider the following statements with reference to the olive ridley turtles. The statement one, their population are distributed across the globe except polar regions. See, from our discussion we know that statement one is wrong because these turtles are distributed only along the warm waters that is circumtropical distribution. So the statement one is wrong. See the statement two. The peculiar behavior of synchronized nesting in mass number is known as Aribada. See, the statement 2 is correct. See the third statement. Gahirmada beach in Odisha is one of the nesting grounds of the world. See, the third statement is correct. Because along with the Gahirmada beach in Odisha, there are also few nesting grounds of olive ridley across the world. They are along the Ganjam coast and minor pockets of Coromandel and Sri Lankan coast. So, the third statement is correct. So the first one is alone wrong, the other two are correct. So the correct option is option B. See the second question. In the context of India and neighbor relations, which of the following statement best depicts the term free movement regime as frequently seen in the news? See, out of four options, see the third option. Since it's a very easy question because we have discussed it in our analysis part. See, the third statement is, this a free movement of tribal across the border on either side of the Indo-Myanmar border. See that this statement is correct as we saw in our news discussion. So the correct option is option C. See the third question. Consider the following statements with reference to Election Commission of India. Statement 1. It resolves the dispute related to splits or mergers of the recognized political parties. See, statement 1 is correct as uh, Election Commission grants recognition to the political parties and it also allows the symbols according to the political parties and moreover also it will settle the disputes related to the political parties. So the first statement is correct. See the second one. It administers the election to the offices of president and vice president. See this is the basic statement as we know that this is correct. See the third one. It is responsible for deciding the election schedule for the conduct of both general and by election. See this is also out of our uh, commonsensical knowledge. We can easily say that this is also correct. So the three statements are correct. So the correct option is option C. See this is the quiz question of the day. I will post it in the community section. Interested aspirants can try and answer this question. See, the main question based on today's analysis is also displayed here. Interested aspirants can write and post it in the comment section. If you like today's video, like, comment and share it with your friends. For other updates regarding UPSC preparation, subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy. Thank you.